you know, uh, look for emotions first. Emotions? Yeah. You know, what? if I figure out what's driving you, like if I tell what you're passionate about, and you're passionate about getting better, mm-hmm. and you're passionate about helping other people, mm-hmm. and you're passionate about healthy competition, mm-hmm. and, and you are fueled by a great feeling of achievement and comp- competition at the same time, and you're more likely to do stuff and engage in activities that fuel both of those things at the same time. Right. And the openly competitive people are either openly competitive because competition makes it feel good or um, it's a defensive thing. Mm-hmm. And you need to know the difference between somebody who attacks you because they're being defensive and they're afraid they're going to get hurt and they're very fear-driven. Yes. And a person that's attacking you because they're just very competitive. And a very competitive type just likes competition, makes a great ally. Whereas a person who's uh, attacking you out of fear, they're not good long-term allies because mm. they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna feel at some point in time they gotta screw you before you screw them. Wow! And so understanding the distinctions in those drivers, those two people look almost exactly the same. Like I, I dated, uh, I, had a, I had a phenomenal social relationship with a woman who was in real estate here in town three or four years ago. And she was she was very she was fear of loss overwhelmingly fear of loss driven in and she, relationships and business and everything right mm. she was always she was always just horrified that she was getting cheated and and she didn't have great she didn't have great business partnerships um she was very successful but not a lot of great partners mm. and that's a it's a slight change you know there's a two millimeter change there between the competitive because they like competition or the, or the aggressive assaulted because they're afraid of getting cheated. And I need to know that, those differences because it's going to tell me what kind of a partner you're going to be. How do you know those differences? Just by being aware, listening? and Yeah, you know, you, you, uh, the emotional intelligence comes to you really fast once you start looking for it. Right. Uh, that's why that some people uh, are really good at cold reads. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, one of the classes I'm teaching at Georgetown right now there's a, a, a really brilliant young lady who's Afghani, and she loves a cold read. Uh, you know, starting to make educated guesses about somebody real mm, quick. Yes. And she's talking to a cab driver the other day, and a cab driver turns around and looks at her and says, did my wife send you? Because <laughs> she, guessed, she guessed the guy's daughter's name. She guessed a lot of things that were accurate about his daughter and his wife just based on a quick interaction. Wow. And for her, it was a game, which is another thing. Sure. If it becomes fun for you, you pick it up faster. Right. So you can get really good at this as soon as you start trying to look. And it, it, it's amazing. It'll also go away quickly, too. Yeah. you got to watch it's it. It's a muscle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah atrophy. Exactly mm-hmm. right. Yeah. you you got you to train on it. Wow. What's a word you'd never say in a negotiation or the worst thing to say? Um, Business deals or personal relationships or... Uh, it de- uh, depends upon what's coming out, of, uh, whose mouth it's coming out of. Like, do you ever say no, or do you ever say? You, you, you know, I might need to say no. I I'll probably I like to let no out a little at a time, which is actually how am I supposed to do that? Is the first way that I say no. That's no without saying no. Right. That's that's saying no to what's on the table, but not no to you. Let's figure if we can work this out. There may come a point in time when I when I say no, said and done. Um, but I'm, I'm going to need to explore every option there. I mean, I don't – saying uh, – hearing yes is a bad thing to hear. So don't say yes. Yeah, y- yes in and of itself. I, I would much rather say, you know, okay, I'll do it. I'd, I'd lo- I love to say you win because when you win, you're going to perform. Hmm. Yes is nothing without how. I need you to perform at a top level. Hmm. You perform at a higher level when you feel like you win. If I if I hear if you look at me and we make a deal and you say okay, well that's a resigned okay, and we're going to run into trouble when we go to implement because the, the minute anything mm. bad could happen by you by your inaction, you know there's a phrase never be mean to someone who could hurt you by doing nothing, mm. which nearly everybody can hurt you by doing nothing. Right. Um, so saying okay I'll do it. Right. Or yes you win or you win. Right. Right. Yes. I, I I want you to feel like you won. You win. So you got the better end of the deal. Yeah. 
Because are are you are you going to hold to the deal if you got the best end of the deal? Right, of course, you love it. You can brag yeah. about awesome. it. Awesome, yeah. I got the better end, huh? Right. So you win. Okay, I'll do it. You win. You can do both of them together. Um, if I say it, that's good because you won. If you say it, it's bad to me because you feel beat. Mm. I don't want you to. I don't want you to feel beaten. Right, right, right. Which is one of the real big problems with negotiation because since since I've been getting helping people get better at it, like. I get more stories of guys says, let me tell you about this deal. I had them over a barrel. There was nowhere for them to go. You know, for all intents and purposes, I took them hostage. Well, I, I guarantee you that the person they beat um, was as passive aggressive as possible on the implementation of that deal. Mm, they didn't feel they good about it. money on the table. They didn't feel good about it. Right. Huh. Right. So I always make the other person feel like they got the better end of the deal. Right? Right. They won. and Yeah, they won. And it, it was their idea. It was their idea. I like your idea. I'll do it. Something like that. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that that's really good. And so that's why the one, usually the one word answers of yes and no, those are all so frequently misunderstood. Mm. You know, there's three kinds of yeses. There's commitment, confirmation, counterfeit. Huh. And most people are used to getting lured into a trap with yes. You know, would you like to make more money? Isn't it true this is the off season? You know, whatever setup, <laughs> yes, there is. Would you like? Okay, yeah. Um, you know what's leading someplace? Yes. One of my uh, one of my students is on a honeymoon, and he's wanting to get um, uh, an upgrade on his bungalow, and it's the off season in this in this resort. Now, what they typically do is they cut prices on on their basic rooms, but, but they not don't the honeymoon cut, suites. But not the honeymoon right. suites. And he, but he knows they're all vacant. Now, what he he doesn't want to cut price on a regular room. He wants a honeymoon suite, and he starts out the conversation with like, you know, isn't it true this is the off season? The general manager knows there's a trap there. So what's know, he say? And, and so the guy starts going sideways on him immediately. Oh, really? He didn't say yes. Right. He didn't want to say yes because he knows that yes is commitment and yes is probably a trap. And he, he knows, I don't know where you're going with this, but you're going someplace. That's what he said? Yeah. <laughs> and then what happened? Well, then, and so then uh, my student realized that, you know, he fell into this, this yes trap thing. Mm. So he had to kind of he had to kind of get back out of it. And they started talking, and instead of trying to get yeses and nos on him, he started describing the situation. It started showing him a little bit. Yeah, well, I'm sure, you know, a lot of guys on, like me come in, we want a room, we don't want to pay anything for it. You, know, you get so many tourists that are in here in the off-season, and they're cheap. That's why they're here in the off-season anyway, because they're cheap to start with, and they don't right. want to pay anything for, for anything anyway. And now the, the managers appreciate where the guy's coming from. Uh, so he ends so up leading getting, with the negative. Right. He ends up, he ends up getting the upgrade. Really, yeah, it's free because he built a relationship and yeah, the guy, the guy, the guy's got an empty room. Yeah, never be meeting somebody who could hurt you by doing nothing. Not giving you the the empty room is doing nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, you want this guy to give you a favor, and he doesn't own the hotel, <clears throat> and those rooms are normally vacant anyway. So his owner, whoever owns the hotel, they're not mad at him because those rooms are empty. They expected them to be empty. Yeah, so he's got options. You know, ultimately, you want to make the pitch like, you know, you give me that upgrade, I'm going to be a fan for life. I'm going to tell everybody I'm going to come how back, well I was promote treated. It. Yeah. I'm going to tell all my friends about this. Something I've done for like the last 10 years, a friend of mine told me this line that he's like, you know, if you ever want an upgrade, if you ever want like something better in the deal, that use this line. And I swear I've been using it. Maybe it's been wrong, but I'd love your opinion. All right. I say, what's the chance you can help me with this? All right. So that's a, that's a what question to start what's with. What's the it's chance? Two things about that that yeah. I like. Um, first of all, it's a what question. Yeah. And secondly, um, what's the chance you can upgrade me? You're uh, elevating the person when you ask it for help. So you're giving them power, right? Right. The opportunity to have power. Right. Yeah. So there's, and and I don't know that I'd change that sentence at all. I might say in advance, like, look, this is really going to seem greedy of me. Mm. You know, because so you can't, you can't leading with the negative. Leading, leading with the negative. Wow. If you if you try to call out a negative that's not there, you won't plant it. If you try to deny a negative that's not there, you plant that baby. And that's why you have to know the difference between a denial and a straight observation. 
And those, that's a subtle difference. Because you're, go, you're probably going to want to say before you ask a guy for a discount, you're probably going to say, this guy's going to think I'm cheap and I'm greedy. I don't want him to think that. Mm-hmm. So if you mention it at all, you've got instinct to say, look, I don't want you to think I'm cheap and greedy here. That's a denial. That plants mm. it. So uh, I bet you might think that I'm being a little greedy. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's, it's coming across. Greedy. I'm coming, that, that yeah. I'm being greedy, but what's the chance you can help? You can upgrade me. Yeah, yeah. You can support me in getting upgraded. And, and so if you're not, if asking for an upgrade as a human being, the, the guy's going, no, that's not greedy. You want him, you want him thinking no. You want him saying no. Mm. No is a great answer because when somebody says no, they def- have just protected and defended themselves. Like it's ridiculous. You will be stunned at what people are willing to say no to. <laughs> I mean, just absolutely stunned. I'm, I'm, I'm coaching a guy <laughs> who's working on a new position with the city of Beverly Hills, and they, they're constructing. Since it's a new position, he sees his job description and he wants to take, but it's problematic the way they put it together. Yeah, and he says, "How do I negotiate with these guys?" Because this job description is not going to make it work. And I said, look at, look, at, look at him across the table and say, do you want me to fail? And their answer is no. And I said, well, look at how this is set up. I, you know, I'd love to have this job. But he's, instead of saying, he wants us to sit down with him and say, hey, look, this is never going to work the way you guys designed this. Right. You can't say that, though. You can't say that. Because so, then they're coming from defense mode or something. Or, right, right, uh, right. Now their ego's in a way. But you say, oh. because when you say, you, do you want me to fail? I mean, that, that's, that's, that no, gives them again to, to help you. Yeah, they say no. They protect themselves. You then come to the other guy's rescue. I mean, you're, you're punching a lot of really powerful emotional triggers there when you say to somebody, do you want me to fail? Hmm. And, and one way or the other, I mean, we try to sit down and think of the most ridiculous question that they would never say yes to. Like if, if, if at the end of the negotiation, uh, if I can't, if my one of my last things I'm always going to say is like, if you can't budge at all, I'll say, all right, well, look, uh, it seems like you're powerless here. Oh, because nobody hurts. wants to say yes to oh. that. <laughs> wow, seems like there's nothing you could do, it seems like wow. you're completely powerless here. And they'll put you on hold, they'll find a way to help. <laughs> so it seems like you're powerless. You can't help me. It sounds like you're powerless here. Right. Nobody ever wants to say yes to that. Wow. Yeah. That is powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you use that a lot when you're at the end of the any phone deal, bill or anything or something? You at know? the end of any deal, if we haven't come to an agreement that, that I'm happy with, that'll be the last thing. I'll say it seems like there's nothing I could say. And it seems like you're powerless. It seems like nothing that you could say to them to right. get what you need. Right. Or for them to move. Right. The deal points, and it seems like you're powerless. Right. They're powerless. Right. Holy cow. That's, yeah. that's powerful insight. So, yeah, we, we a lot of people have cut deals by they thought it was completely in the tank. and They're actually just trying to end positively. It's really it's critical to end positively. Mm. So give me one little extra thing then if, you know, they want to end positively, not like, yeah, I'm powerless here, so let's do the deal. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll throw in this, or I'll give you this. Or- yeah. Like I make it, I make it a regular part. Uh, like my credit cards, almost all of them got fees, mm-hmm. and I call every year, and ask them to waive the fee, yeah. and and they almost always do. Until the guy says, "Well, we waived the fee on you the last five years in a row." <laughs> so it sounds like you're powerless here. And I, I'll say, "Yeah, I'll say that. I'll say it sounds like you're absolutely powerless here. It sounds like you're nothing, nothing you could do." And they'll put me on hold. Say, Let me see what I could do. <laughs> They'll come back and do it because nobody wants to be powerless. Oh, wow. That's great. First things first, the yes momentum. If you've read the book, and I'm sure pretty much all of you have, and probably multiple times, we don't like yes. If you've learned the yes momentum or mere agreement, I imagine you probably got a problem with some of the things that I'm saying now and will say. But what are the problems with yes? The reality is we stay away from yes because there are inherent problems with yes. The reality is people feel tied down when they are required to answer with a yes. The other part about this, the myth of getting people to say yes to a bunch of little things so that they'll say yes to the big thing is in fact a myth. 
Do you want to make more money? Uh, do you wish you had more time? Do you wish you could go out because, you know, the, the pandemic's getting in the way? Do you want to give me $10 million? Doesn't actually work that way. And the other thing about trying to get people to say yes is it unfortunately shows a serious lack in emotional intelligence. Because at face value, yes is going to make people nervous. And if you're forcing people into a place where you know they're going to feel nervous, the emotional intelligence is lacking. So we stay away from this altogether. We, we look at this as basically it's a bear trap at the end of that rainbow if you're on the yes path. And so what's our alternative? Our alternative is no oriented questions. All of you that have read the book have seen this. You have some feel for it. And so real quick, I'm going to share a short story with you. Some of you may have even heard this on Chris's keynotes about dealing with Jack Welch. So Jack's in L.A. several years ago. While Chris is living in the area, he and I at the time were actually teaching a negotiation course at the Marshall School of Business at USC for the, uh, the graduate program. He goes to a book signing to see Jack. Oh, and if you don't know who Jack Welch is, obviously he's an author. We're talking about Chris going to a book signing to get an author from him. But he was a huge businessman. He's not with us anymore, but he ran GE in the 80s and 90s, turned it into one of the fastest growing companies in the United States. He was actually named manager of the century in 1999, which I don't know if there's a higher accolade than that. And... He, he developed this rank and yank system at GE and, and was also adopted in many other places in the corporate world, which essentially means you don't hit certain standards, you're gone. There is no second chance. You got a standard to meet. You don't get there. We're going to roll you out and bring in somebody that can't get the job done. So very big guy, philanthropist, author, a lot of people look up to him and, and, and follow his doctrines as a businessman, even still today. So Chris is at this signing. He wants to see if Jack will come teach at his class at USC. Now, if you know anything about book signings, you got about five seconds with the author. Security's job is to keep people moving through. Chris doesn't have time to have a full conversation with Jack. Do an accusations audit, to do a summary, label and mirror his responses. He doesn't have time to do any of that. He's got to, he's got to do a quick hitter and it's got to be emotionally intelligent and he's got to do it now. And so he walks up to Jack and if you've heard the story, you know that he says, is it ridiculous for you to come speak in my class at USC? And as the story goes, Jack gets a very intense look on his face, looks up and to the left and just kind of freezes with this very angry look. In that moment, Chris thinks to himself, I just killed Jack Welsh. He's an old guy, and he's so angry at my question that he's actually having a stroke in front of me, and he's going to drop dead, and security's going to drag me out of here by my ankles, and I'm going to jail. And after about 10 seconds of this intense look, Jack looks back at Chris, and he says, here's a Twitter handle that's private that only people use internally in my company. My assistant actually runs this as me. I'm going to let her know that you're going to reach out to her through this Twitter handle so that we can keep in touch. And I think we're supposed to be back in L.A. in the fall. This is sometime in the spring of that year. He says, if we're back in L.A. at that time frame, I will come speak at your class at USC. Now, the long of it is, Jack wasn't, in fact, back in the fall. Very busy guy. Couldn't make it, so it didn't happen. However, he got the commitment in the moment. Why is that? Obviously, the no oriented question. But what happened? What happened in Jack Welsh's brain in that moment that made it so easy for him to answer? And the crazy thing about no oriented questions, and I wish we could point to a specific brain science study that lays this out. Maybe there will be soon, right, with fMRI machines and this wonderful technology and being able to plug electrodes into people's brains. I'm sure there'll be a study at some point that explains how this works. What we've observed as negotiators, as 
content experts, as former hostage and crisis negotiators. When you allow someone to say no to you, and in fact, when you aim at someone saying no to you, it clears their thought process. As a lot of you have thrown into the chat, some of the problems with yes, because yes makes people nervous, the instant reaction is, how do I defend myself in this moment? And that clutters up the brain. It doesn't allow us to be cognitively flexible when we're worried about how we have to defend ourselves. And so he confronted Jack over a very specific want, did it without a confrontational reaction, and cleared Jack's thought process to lay out the implementation of how it would work all at the same time with a very simple question. And so you can take our word for it, or you can do what we're going to implore you to do as a result of this class and our next two. Go out and start executing this stuff if you're not already. If you are executing this stuff already, then you should start developing your go-to list. If you listen to anything we've talked about before, you know we talk a lot about go-to labels. The reality is when the heat is on, you fall to your highest level of preparation. And as a result of that, we like to have go-to lists of every single skill that we talk about. And we keep that stuff near to us, right? Laminate it, put it in your jacket pocket, make a list, put it on your desk, we even had a, a good client and now friend of ours sent us a picture of his office and he had what we would refer to as situation boards set up in different frames all over his office that had lists of skills that he executes on a daily basis in his negotiations. So it's going to help you to have a cheat sheet. Cheat sheet never get beat. That's what we like to say. And so that should apply to the Norrington questions as well. As you can see on the slide here, on the left, we have our classic yes questions. On the right, we have our classic versions of how to begin a Norrington questions. Would it be impossible? Is it a bad idea? Am I out of line? Is it, would it be out of the question? And so... What I'm going to ask from you now, here's a chance to get some more coaching from Sandy. This slide is, an, is, is a more extensive list of classic yes questions that everybody asks. I'm guilty of asking them in the past. People on our team were even guilty of asking these things in the past. And so pick one or two of the questions off this list and please translate it to a no-oriented question in the chat. And the other thing about this, this is actually a fairly decent prep model. Any yes question can easily be translated to a no question. A good way to do it, 10, 15 minutes before you walk into a negotiation, you want to work on your no-oriented questions. Take a piece of paper, draw a line down the center. On the left, add, put the questions that you would normally want to say, have them say yes to. Don't you agree that this is going to help your company? Don't you want to sign this contract? Don't you want to move forward so we don't waste any more time? Whatever. Draw that line, and on the right, just simply put the no-oriented translation of what that is. And that's a really good way to start getting yourself acclimated, starting to develop your go-to list, as it were. And so last thing I want to mention about this, something we highlight in the book, but it's not laid out here in the slides, is simply the no to question that's phrased, are you against? And this, if you're in any sort of sales role, maybe sales isn't necessarily attached to your title, but there is a sales element to what you do, and for all intents and purposes, we're always selling ourselves, right? I mean, we all know that inherently. And so this are you against has actually shown to be a tremendous closer in the sales world or the closing world, right? However you like to look at it. And simply, are you against moving forward? I guarantee you, 
there are very few people who are using proof of life questions. There are very few people who are using no oriented questions. And there are tons of people who are enamored with yes. And we'll talk about why that's problematic. Um, I often get asked, how did you get hostage takers to say yes to you? And the answer was, we never did. Yes is a useless word. It does you no good. It's one of the, it's one of the hurdles that you're going to have to navigate in order for you to improve the way you communicate between people. There's this nonsense out there called yes momentum in, in academia. They call it mere agreement, which, which suggests that you're likely to get an agreement to a big ask if there have been micro agreements previous to the ask. Example, uh, do you like clean water? Do you think people who abuse animals should be held to higher account? Do you think the women's national team should get paid as much as the men's national team? Buy my product. The yeses that precede the big ask, they say, doesn't even have to be related to the ask itself. Some people refer to it as the yesable proposition or my favorite, the yes tie down. Think about that for a second. Someone is trying to use yes to tie you down and you like that? Or, or the other side of the coin, you're using yes to tie someone else down and, and you like that? Yes is commitment. Yes encroaches, this, encroaches on autonomy. Yes makes people defensive. Their anxiety goes up. Um, people will cite studies where Yesable propositions, mere agreement, yes momentum work. And I'm not here to say that it doesn't work. I'm just here to say if you're using it, your batting average is not as high as it should be. Yes is a lure. It's a hack. It's seductive. We know how good it sounds. And in that moment, we fail to recognize that we have put the other side on the defensive. So we got to get out of the habit. Think about it like this. How do you feel when the phone rings and the person on the other side, I don't care if they're close to you or not, they ask you, do you have a few minutes to talk? Most of you don't think to yourselves, Oh my God, yes, I do have a few minutes. I'm glad you called. Four things usually run, uh, uh, run through your brain almost simultaneously. First, how long is a few minutes? Second, if I have a few minutes to talk, do I want to talk to you? Third, if I want to talk to you, do I want to talk about what you want to talk about? And fourth, how can I get off the phone? We have been hammered with yes, yes. We know, we feel it instinctively when people are trying to drive us somewhere, when people are trying to commit us to something and we resent it. We don't like committing to something that we haven't volunteered for. And so instead of a pot of gold, at the end of the rainbow, it's usually set up for a trap. We love to hear it so much, but in that instance, we should know that we're putting the other side on the defensive. I didn't feel comfortable using the calibrated questions and saying, how am I supposed to do that? 
So I changed it a little in a way I felt more comfortable. And I would say, like, that's going to be really difficult. And we're going to have to try to think of a creative solution. And then that kind of trying to imply how am I supposed to do that? Um, and I mean, they talk after it and, and give suggestions. So I, I think it's working. It is working. And, and here's, here's the difference between what you did and how am I supposed to do that? First of all, how am I supposed to do that is a phase of no. That is an assertive move. So you want to hold on to that for later in the conversation or the relationship when it's more appropriate. But the way you set it up means that you are, you're priming them for it. You're lowering the expectation so that if it does become a, how am I supposed to do that? It's not going to be a shock to the system because you've already set them up. So I, I love the way you're playing around with it. Now you're starting to make this stuff your own, which is the ultimate goal is to take these skills and make them a part of your repertoire. You say and do things differently than the way that I say and do things. Troy says them in a way that uh, it's different for me as well. Everybody's got their own spin on the black swan method. Yeah, I, I've seen the ability to take someone off their guard and to have them really disarmed and having an open discussion. And then the slightest little thing can throw that back up. And it's not necessarily something where I say something really difficult to you. Just the slight trigger can bring it back up. And I've been listening to other meetings we have with other people at my office that host those meetings. And they have someone completely disarmed. And then they say something like, hey, I've been in the business a long time too, implying you're not the only one that knows this shit. Right. And then when that happens, like, you had them for like an hour. They were just stringing along saying, yeah, I could see that. I understand that. And then you threw that in. You just worked backwards. So I'm trying to use the ways to keep them disarmed as long as possible. And then when I have to get serious, you drop the tone and say, that is something that will have to remain. And then they know like that it's, they're not going to get movement on there because I've only said that with that voice twice out of 50 other times, you know? Yeah. Um, but I've seen people arm up so quick. So I'm trying to be aware of, you can get everything right 90% of the time and that 10% can completely burn you for all that work you put in. Yeah. If, 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 like, yeah, if you're not, if you're not careful, that can happen. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to drop the bomb on somebody at some point, and you're going to have to draw your line in the sand. And so when you're switching into that late night FM DJ voice to convey your assertiveness, remember that that assertiveness is the precursor to that should be something from the tactical empathy side of the ledger, as well as the accusations audit side of, side of the ledger. So, you know, I, I'm sorry. I ran it up the flagpole. Nobody saluted. We just can't do that. I'm sorry. I ran it up the flagpole. Nobody saluted. This is going to catch you off guard. This is going to be disappointing to hear. It's going to feel like I punched you in the stomach. We just can't do that. Vaughn, what do you got? A similar kind of a, how am I supposed to do that question? We've been negotiating with the customer for about three or four months. It's a customer we really do not want to work with, but at the price we would be willing to do so. Uh, so we've been going back and forth and back and forth with them, uh, raised our, price, our prices quite a bit. And then they started uh, to do something very interesting. So picking apart our proposal uh, kind of a la carte. Uh, and that was going over about a two week span, uh, until I went in and I just said, you know, how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to let you pick apart my proposal like that? And they went completely dark for two days. And then Friday they said, you know what, we're going to go ahead and sign the proposal. So I, I don't know what the two days was. I don't know why it did that. I don't, I don't know what prompted that, but it really made them make a decision because we all, all I said was, my email was just, how am I supposed to do that? And I just let them stew for two days. And they came back with a signed proposal. 
that's one of the purposes behind why or how am I supposed to do that or the other phases of no is for them to go back and start to bargain with themselves so that you don't have to. Yeah. It's a thought shaping question. You're shaping their thought. You're engaging the, the, the uh, problem solving or the critical thinking portion of their brain. And so that's perfect. Let them go back and stew for two days. You haven't told them no, and you haven't offered any other solutions. You have in essence told them you go back and figure it out, which is what they did. Nicely done. Talk about the phases of no. Um, we call this letting no out slowly. So when you're trying, when somebody's trying to get you to do something or trying to get you to, to, to buy something or whatever they're trying to get you to do, and you want to say no, you don't necessarily want to go along with it. Um, there are different phases of no that you can use. Now, anyone who has read the book knows the line, how am I supposed to do that? You need to be extremely careful with how am I supposed to do that? People throw that line around like it's God's answer to everything. And it really isn't unless you're using it appropriately. Okay. When you say, how am I supposed to do that? It is basically an assertion when it doesn't have the precursor of empathy. In other words, if you've not used empathy, if you've not tried to get that tactical empathy all the way through your conversation, if you come out with a, how am I supposed to do that? It's going to come across as assertive. Because what you're trying to do when you say, how am I supposed to do that? Is you're trying to trigger empathy in the other side. So if you say it like this, how am I supposed to do that? Am I going to trigger empathy with that tone of voice? No. Okay. So how you want to say this, how am I supposed to do that? Or how am I supposed to do that? Wherever you want to put the inflection, but it's like a thoughtful, seriously, I need you to tell me how am I supposed to do that? Okay. But you, people are not going to care to help you with implementation things and how you're supposed to do that if you've not been using empathy with them all the way through the conversation because they don't feel any empathy toward you. Because remember, if you've used tactical empathy and you've sought to the other, understand the other side, when the time comes, they will seek to understand you. They will use a little bit of that reciprocity, we hope. Most personality types will. And they will try to understand you. And when you put that out there like that, with that implementation question, if you're using the right amount of tactical empathy, they will, tr it'll trigger in them. Okay. And you can work with that. So how am I supposed to do that? That's the first way of saying no. If you say it wrong, they may come back with, I don't know, that's your problem. Figure out. I'm not, not my job to do that. If you've not used the appropriate amount of empathy before you try to make that, it's going to come across as an assertion and that's the response you're going to get. Okay. How am I supposed to do that? You want a, a, an answer from them that's going to give you some information about how, really how you're supposed to do that. They might give you some kind of an explanation. If you're still feeling like you want to say no, you can say, you know, I'm sorry, your, your offer is, is very generous. I just don't know how I can do that. Talking goes on a little bit more. You're still not liking what they're offering. You're going to say, I'm sorry, that just isn't going to work for me. And then when they get down to that last one, you're going to say, mm, no. Basically, by doing all of those things, if you know you want to say no to somebody, but you want to protect the relationship for further down the road in case you want to actually do business with these people again, letting no out slowly is the best way to do it. It's like a thoughtful, I've really thought about this and oh my gosh, it kills me, but I'm just, I'm not going to be able to do business with you. Letting no out slowly with those four steps like that before you get to that final no um, is going to save the relationship with the business or whoever the person that you're working with. I'm a little nervous about asking this question to law enforcement professionals because it's more on the emotional side, but okay. I'm headed to... Uh, a pretty aggressive custody negotiation. Okay. And um, so there's 17 years of hurt feelings on this. And so um, I'm really worried about having an emotional reaction and mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out how to get out of my head to mirror and label for that person um, and not get overwhelmed in that situation. And I wondered, I'm sure you don't 
start to cry in hostage negotiation <laughs> situations, but I'm just wondering if you have any advice for that. Yeah, sure. And I'd be happy, happy to add in some thoughts. And then what I'm actually going to do is, is throw it to a real hostage negotiator. I'm going okay. to ask for Troy's thoughts on this. Cause for those of you who don't know, I was te- never technically in law enforcement, okay. but I'm blessed to work with many, many uh, uh, legendary law enforcement professionals and, and they're on the call with us and Troy's one of them. And so he runs uh, a couple classes for us. One is a, we call caviar, which is all about mindset going in and, and understanding what your triggers are a little bit and how to combat those. So I'll add a thought and then Troy, I'll throw it to you. My first thought is simply going to be mental preparation. Know that you are going to get triggered. Like no matter how hard I try, something's going to happen that's going to trigger me here. And if, if you're at least mentally prepared for knowing the punch is coming, you'll be re- that much more ready for it when it does come. And then secondarily, um, focusing on simply putting all your focus on the skills, which is not an easy thing to do, especially in a highly emotional state. It is not easy to do because we get so caught up in like, that's wrong. I need to tell you why it's wrong. And I need to correct you. Right. It's hard to fight that. But if we can switch mentally to just like, what skill do I need to drop in here to diffuse this? What skill do I need to drop in? Because right. They got a lot of adrenaline running through their system right now. And I need to drop in dopamine because I need them positive and I got to get rid of this adrenaline stuff. What's the skill that I can use to actually trigger dopamine? That at least will will um, damper down the thoughts of like, you idiot, how could you? I can't believe you, son of a... Right? And, and at least if we're focused on the skills. So those, those are two things I would add quickly. Troy, what, what else would you add to this? Because this, this definitely falls in your wheelhouse of expertise. You definitely want to stay curious. If you're staying curious and asking, why are they saying these things? Why are they behaving this way? It's going to take away the emotional side of it for, for you mostly, where you're, you're searching for answers for them. What, what make them say that? What, what is making them behave that way? And for yourself, you want to get with a trusted colleague and vent before you go into the room or before you, before you actually go on the call or sit down with, across from that individual. You want to vent about all the things that you think are going to happen or going to come up in that room that's going to be an issue. But you want to find somebody that's going to be positive when they talk to you, because if you go in there and they've already fed you full of negative stuff, you're going to have a negative mindset going in. You want to have a positive mindset. And one of the things that Brandon said that is so important when he was talking about the person getting angry or getting upset, they can only do it for 45 seconds to a minute. If you can hold on for that ride, you're going to be okay. They wear themselves out. They don't realize how much stress and how fatiguing it becomes for them. So when they do that, the longer you can sustain your your calm, you're going to wear them down. And they're finally going to just throw their hands up and like, shh. But if you get angry and they get angry, they talk about the amygdala, you're going to have two dumb people in the room and you can't, and it don't work when you have that. Right. Do you have any suggestions? He'll have a lawyer in that situation as well as himself. And so I'm trying to figure out how to control both personalities because one's an accommodator and one's an analyst, I think. And I'm the lawyer is more unknown to me. So I'm trying to figure out how to control those personal when there's two personalities coming at me at the same time, how to control that scenario. Labels and mirrors. Okay. You just seems like both of y'all want to talk at the same time. It sounds like one has an agenda. The other one has an agenda. Thank you. That was excellent. Let me start out by reminding you one of the Black Swan Group's great rules 
The secret to gaining the upper hand in any negotiation is giving the other side the illusion of control. If somebody gives you a take it or leave it offer in negotiations, there's kind of only three possibilities. Number one, they're either highly insecure. Number two, they're under a lot of pressure. Number three, they're testing you. I recently spoke to Mark Cuban about this. I did an interview with him on Fireside, a new social media app. And I'd noticed before he likes to do the take it or leave it offers a lot on Shark Tank. So I told him, you know, I think you're testing people to see how they handle the pressure, to see how they can represent you. Because one time on Shark Tank, he said, look, you got to take this offer from me. You can't talk to anybody else. Take it or leave it right now before you speak to anybody else. And the entrepreneur looked back at him and said, if I was representing you, you wouldn't want me to get pushed around like that, would you? Subtle side hit. That's a no-oriented question. And he stopped and he relaxed for a second and he said, now, you can go ahead and talk to them. He likes to test people. He likes to see how they bear up under pressure. So let's go back to how he started. They're highly insecure. Or they're under a lot of pressure. Or even they're testing you. I've got four approaches for you for dealing with this. Number one, the no-oriented question, which was pretty much the one that I just gave you a few moments ago. You wouldn't want me to get pushed around if I was representing you, would you? It's an obvious no. Here's another one that can help with the other two types. Is it disrespectful if I ask to clarify a few points? If they're insecure or they're under a lot of pressure, of course, getting somebody to say no makes them feel safe and secure. And they're happy to proceed. And what you want someone who's either insecure or under a lot of pressure to feel is safe and secure. So this is a great way for our first response. The next response, use a mirror. Repeat the last three words of what they just said. So take it or leave it offer. Your mirror would be, take it or leave it? With that upward inflection. Boy, that upward inflection is great for making sure something lands gently. Even something you're afraid may sound harsh. So again, I'll do it for you. Take it or leave it? It's gentle and it's inquiring. Mirrors are great for keeping people talking. Number three, a gentle label. Here's a good label to use. It sounds like there's no movement on any of these points. Notice the downward inflection, or you could hit them with the upward inflection. It sounds like there's no movement on any of these points. Either way, a gentle label gets people talking. If there's no movement, they're going to tell you that. Most likely, they'll soften someplace. Read what they say. Read the look in the moment. Gather data with your eyes. If you're on the phone, listen to how long the silence is before they answer and what their tone of voice is when they do answer. Number four, use generosity to your advantage in your label. Say, you've been very generous. It sounds like there's nothing more you can do. Now, you want to get generosity out of people, even when they're seeming stingy and pushy, and especially when they're seeming stingy and pushy. While you feel they're being stingy and pushy, they probably feel they're being generous. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's what empathy is all about. So if you need more generosity from the other side, Label it to see if you can nurture it and get some more. That's a great thing about saying you've been very generous with someone who doesn't seem particularly generous to you, but understand it's not about you. Chances are if they're being backed into a corner or they feel insecure, they actually feel they're being generous. So you want more of it? Label it. And then the last part, it sounds like there's nothing more you can do. Well, it's very difficult to say yes ever, even to a label. So even if they do say yes, they're going to want to say more. They're going to want to keep talking. Be prepared to mirror and label what they say in response to this label or any of the things that you say and read their tone of voice and look on their face. Remember, one of the cardinal rules of negotiation in the Black Swan group and the Black Swan method is never be mean to someone who could hurt you by doing nothing. 
The flip side of it is, if they feel like it, they could probably do a lot. So this is the way to get them to do as much as they can do and to make them feel good about the process. Remember, it's all about getting your repetitions in. So practice with a friend, family member, or coworker before your next high stakes negotiation to be fully prepared. The three negotiation mistakes that are hurting your deals are number one, listening to respond versus listening to understand. Number two, using I understand. And number three, asking yes oriented questions. Now let's dive in. Number one, listening to respond versus listening to understand. This is the big problem and where really all of your problems stem from. Most people don't listen at all. And if they do listen, they listen to just go, aha, or to contradict, or to jump back in, or to tell somebody why they're wrong. I'm sorry, this is self-centered stuff. To quote Gerard Nuremberg, a negotiation guy that I studied way back when, when I first started this journey, he said, listening is as much about sensing emotions as it is about hearing words. If you're listening to understand, you're sensing emotions. You're trying to figure out where they're coming from. You're taking a focus off you, and you're really putting your focus on them and their perspective and their facts and how they feel about their facts. What has affected them and what kind of reactions has that perception of those effects had on them? That's listening to understand. Now, number two, using I understand. Now, you might say this being very well-intentioned. You might say this because you're trying to express to the other person that you do understand. And this is a misinterpretation of the Covey advice from way back when, seek first to understand, then be understood. And a lot of people, in a very well-intentioned way, will say, I understand, as if it's going to make the other side feel better. Now, your intention is good, but your application is going to fall short. Never in the history of mankind has somebody said to another person, I understand, and stopped there, and had the other person say, oh, thank God, and instantly feel better. Your goal of trying to make them feel understood is the goal. Not that you understand, but that you make them feel understood. And unfortunately, saying, I understand, doesn't make anybody feel understood. As Brandon Voss has always said, if we could reach in your brain and take out the phrase, I understand, entirely, you'd probably be better off. The other problem with the application of this is that most of the time that people have heard this, somebody has said, I understand, but, and then told them why they were wrong. Well, this doesn't make anybody feel good. But is an erasing word. But erases the intention and the words of everything that came before it. So even if you meant to make them feel good, as soon as you said, but, you wiped it out. Now, the second problem with I understand is a lot of people think, okay, so if I do understand, that means that I can tailor my message and it'll really hit home. So in a very well-intentioned fashion, you take as much time as you can beforehand to try to understand. You research them, you reach their situ research their situation. You research everything you can about them. And then you think you do understand, and therefore you can talk and they can listen, and your talk is going to be that much more effective because you understood. Now the goal is to make them feel understood, and the only way you can make them feel understood is to articulate, to express their perspective back to them and look for the words, that's right. That's right is what people say when they feel understood. And that's what you're going for. You're not going for your right, which is when you're pitching and they're just asking you to stop talking. You're going for that's right. Finally, number three, asking yes-oriented questions. 
No, no, no. Now, I know you're probably doing this, and I know you're achieving some success with it. That's the problem. People achieve some success with this. We live in a Las Vegas world. The black swan group and a black swan method is to get you off of the gambling table where you win 10% of the time, which is probably what you do with yes-oriented questions, and move you onto the gambling table where you win 80% of the time. It's about increasing your percentages. There are those of you that are out there that say, I make deals or I come to agreement with yes-oriented questions. That's my data. Yes, you do. And you are not making as many deals as you could make. Now, you could be asking yes-oriented questions of very respectful intention. You're just trying to respectfully confirm that something is true. And from a very early age, you were taught that when you heard the word no, there were problems. Because it's usually the first word that every kid learns. No. Why? Because... Every adult is pointing at them when they do something that they didn't mean to do but was wrong. An adult points at them and says, no. I mean, everybody's got stories about that was the first word their child heard. I don't understand why my kid says no all the time. Well, because you were pointing at them and saying no. So the experience of hearing no has been drilled into our head since we were toddlers that no meant bad. Well, if no is bad, yes must be good. Actually, that's the problem because empathy is about the other side, how the other side feels. So while we were horrified when that adult pointed at us and said no, actually the adult felt good. The adult felt like they were giving direction and it made them feel safe and protected. And this is one of the critical issues of why no is a great response, but also simultaneously while we're horrified by it. We think yes is success. Therefore, no must be failure. Well, who says yes is success? As a matter of fact, there's three kinds of yeses, confirmation, commitment, and counterfeit. And so many people use yes confirmations to try to get people into yes commitment that they get really good at yes counterfeit. And also, everybody's been bashed by this. The entire world is yes battered. Everybody's been walked into a deal or some agreement somewhere at the early stage of their life by a series of yes-oriented questions, and suddenly they found themselves in the middle of something they didn't want to do. And they were scarred by it. They were battered by it. So what happens if you ask a respectful yes question to somebody who's already yes battered? Well, what happens to an abused child when another adult being very well-meaning and knowing that hugs are physically good for people walks up to this abused child and raises their arms. Doesn't matter where your attention is, the child is still going to duck. They're still going to recoil. They're still going to pull back. And this is one of the insidious habits that a lot of people get into in a very well-intentioned fashion that are a slow erosion and toxin on all their relationships. So to recap, number one, instead of listening to respond, listen to understand and work on sensing the emotions when you're understanding so that you do understand. Number two, Instead of saying, I understand, demonstrate what you understand. Articulate it. Make them feel understood, especially with the emotions about their feelings that you sensed when you were listening. And number three, get out of yes-oriented questions entirely. Just stop doing it. Drive for that's right versus yes, or even switch your yes-oriented questions around to no-oriented questions. Great example is, instead of saying, have you got a few minutes to talk? Ask, is now a bad time? Just to experiment with the conversation. 
Good luck implementing the black swan method. And the more you prepare, the more you'll be ready for the next life-changing deal that falls out of the sky. We're gonna do a little bit of Q&A here in a minute. But I want you to know, if you want more, besides the book, if you want to add to it, only if you want more. Uh, we've got a newsletter that comes out once a week, short, sweet newsletter. It's very digestible. It's not one of those that's an encyclopedia that you've got to take a nap after you get done reading. Text FBI Empathy, all one word. Don't let your autocorrect put a space between FBI and Empathy. Send that to 22828. You'll get a dialogue box back that'll sign you up for the newsletter. A lot of people love it as a great supplement to the book. And it's also the gateway to everything that we do. When we, when we do training sessions, open enrollment training sessions, it's a gateway to the website, which is blackswanltd.com. But the newsletter will take you there, read past issues, find out about other stuff that we have. We have, we have quite a bit of free content on the newsletter, uh, on the website, and a lot of articles in the newsletter. You can search them, you can find a lot of stuff there that, that'll help you. Subscribing to the newsletter is a great tool, and it's free, it's complimentary. For those of you like me, formal federal, federal employees, you love free. All right. All right. Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have time for just a, a few quick questions. Uh, so if there's anybody that is dying to ask Chris something, raise your hand and speak loudly. I see a hand over there. That's, yeah, there you go. Go ahead. <laughs> there you go. There you I, go. I, I got a car buying story in the book, and 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 we just and, and on our YouTube channel, uh, a friend of mine, the guy I told you about, was uh, negotiating with South Koreans. He tells his car buying story, and uh, we get good we get good prices. <laughs> <laughs> You do that as a service, by the way. Yeah, is it? yeah. <laughs> I hope you get a car. There you go. There you go. That's good. Yes. Chris, what do you do when you go for a no and you get a yes? Uh, well, see, that's a great question. When you go and, for a no and you get a yes. If you didn't hear the question. Um, first of all, no, like nobody, will, nobody will do that. I, and, I, and I already know. I know how hard it is for anybody to say yes. I mean, it's it's insanely hard. And my son used to challenge me on this. We're, we're walking out of a building in. Uh, uh, with a client here in, in New Jersey across the river and they got a security guard who's checked us in and we're checking out and he's, he's a security guard and he's got allied security. And so my son says, I don't think it's always hard for somebody to say yes to something. And the security guard's right there and I go, I look at him, I go, do you work for allied security? Now he's at work, on duty, he's the same guy that checked us in in the morning, he remembers us from the morning before, he's got a uniform on, says allied security. <laughs> I said, do you work for allied security? And he goes, what do you want to know? Yeah, that's right, that's right. And I look at my son and I go... <laughs> now, in the unlikely event the answer is yes, what you are going to get is silence. They're just not going to say yes. Now, the, on, on one in 10,000, because we like asking ridiculous no questions, you'll be shocked at the no questions we ask. We coach employees to ask their bosses, do you want me to fail? Mm. And, in a, and, and every now and then, if the answer is yes, you will get silence. And also part of negotiation is you go from, knowing, from wondering to knowing. And you're never worse off. You might not like the answer, but you cannot move forward until you know what ground you're standing on. And so if the answer is have you given, you know, a uh, question we send out all the time. Have you given up on doing business with the Black Swan Group? Mm. Mm. If they don't respond, you know what we do next? Pursue someone else. Uh, how many non-responders do you have? You know how many we have? None. Because we don't pursue that business. If they're not going to do business with us, there are lots of people who will. And oh. I'm not wasting my time on people who won't do business with us. Love that, absolutely. Win fast, lose fast. Who else? Another quick question. I'm not seeing a hand. I, I have one really interesting thing I, in, in the book. You, you make this argument that 
the smarter you are, the more difficult it is to be a good negotiator. So there's hope for a lot of us in the room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> talk about that. Why is that? Smart people, people with higher degrees, they want to, they want to, they want to show you how smart they are. You can't get them to shut up. <laughs> I mean, you can't. They just, they just want to show you how, how they've thought, they've thought stuff through. They want, they want you to appreciate how much they've thought stuff through. And so they want to lay it all out for you. They want to help. I mean, it's very well-intentioned stuff, but it's really hard to get those kind of people to, to shut up. Yeah, yeah. And this is, this is about shutting up, asking the question, and getting information from who you're talking to. Getting them to talk, not me to talk. Your counterpart should be talking five times more than you. Yeah. We like to, we like to say, uh, he who talks most loses. Mm. Mm. That's good. That's good. He who talks most loses. Who has a question? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, I'm not asking anything now. I'm just going to listen. Actually, we do have time for, for uh, yeah, yeah, Frank. How about when it comes to like a wife and kids negotiating with that? Yeah, wife and kids negotiating with that. We don't have a lot of time. So. Oh, oh. <laughs> senior, senior executive, although very young lady, uh, um, uh, executive in Silicon Valley is talking to her then fiance now husband one day and she goes why do I like talking to you all of a sudden so you know this last couple of days I've really enjoyed talking to you and he's like ah, taking this class and uh, <laughs> they're teaching this book never split the difference and they're making us do it with the with our wives and our girlfriends <laughs> She went out and bought books for all her girlfriends, husbands, and boyfriends. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. I saw a hand here. Yeah. Hi, yeah. John. Um, my name is John. Melvin Williams from Eminem. Hi, right, Melvin. Um, just wanted to know if, if it's a ridiculous idea Ooh. for me to ask you if you could clear your schedule for the rest of the day. Um, a lot of the businesses in your area today that we've been working with, they've experienced some security outbreaks, and we've been trying to work with them. And um, most of the businesses are struggling to fight technology today. And really, I understand everything that you're going through. So I'm just wondering, is it possible for you to clear your schedule so we can talk about and help you grow your business? Uh, all right, so what, what, so what did he, he... Break that down. He, he pitched like crazy, right? He, yeah. he's, he, what he, he, he did a nice job. He, took, he says, it's a ridiculous idea for me to clear my schedule for the rest of, rest of the day. And then it, he three, four sentences to lay out the pitch. And then he said, I understand, which is bad. You should never say I understand. You had a really good start. Your pitch needs to be a lot sh shorter. But you're, I didn't, did I pitch with that father? No, you didn't. No. Yeah. I didn't, that was the other thing I didn't do. I didn't pitch the father. I didn't pitch solutions. I didn't pitch answers. I said, here's what you're looking at. And waited to see if he was going to interact with me on what he was looking at. So you got a good start. That's a, the, the first fact that you already picked up on a, to starting out with a, with a no-oriented question is, but you're still wired to pitch. Yeah. You're still wired to pitch. Yeah. And getting a that's right out of the other side before you proceed. Seek first to understand before you can be understood. You should get a that's right before you make the pitch. On top of that, when you get the feedback from, back from your counterpart, you guys have a broad value proposition. How do you know which portion of that proposition is valuable. Mm -hmm. Your counterpart, you, you, got, you got seven selling points, your counterpart might be interested in two. Every time spent on the other five, top five is your counterpart is starting to go to sleep on you. Yeah. So the, the guidance that you want to get, you want to know exactly which part of your pitch matters to them. And then, now that you've honed, you know which part of the value proposition is actually there for them, now you can go into it. Yeah. So you're on the right track. Good start, and, and, and there's a coach going on the right You have track. a good example of that on the podcast we just released, Chris, where you know, we, we role play a little bit where we say, hey, you know, Chris, I was at your, at your website, saw one of your videos, really liked it, would love to understand more about, about Black Swan. You know, give me your pitch real quick. Uh, what do you guys do, and how does this all work? Right? Yeah. And so my answer was, sounds like you're not sure we're valuable. Hmm. Or it would be. Yeah. Because I need to know what you think is valuable. I, we don't make, we don't pitch. Yeah. We find out what matters. Yeah. 
And then if what you're looking for is not us, we're like, ah, you're not looking for us. Because we need to talk to people that are looking for us. So much of what you talk about is counter counterintuitive and, and kind of goes against how we've always operated. This isn't an easy shift for people to make. Uh, the 63, I think I heard repetitions get it. Get to make a reps. habit, they'll get there. Yeah, yeah. and a little awesome. bit of practice and prep. So yeah. I got a video to show you about the Perfect. value of preparation. Fire me. Go for it. All right, slides back up. A proof of life video, that's what they're called, the ultimate good news, bad news story, if you're ever unfortunate enough to see one. Today, high, today's high stakes rescue mission in Columbia ended a drama that has been dragging on for years. Chris Voss is the former FBI lead international kidnapping negotiator, and he worked on the... All right, so in terms of preparation, what are my preparation issues here? It's a little dark, but on the right-hand side of my head, my hair is sticking out the side. <laughs> so this was the first time I was ever on CNN. Like, I got to tell you something. I thought this was cool. Like, I'm going to go in. There are more people watching Anderson Cooper on CNN than are in my hometown back in Iowa. And there's so much I don't know. Like, I heard they have a green room. Do they have a green room? And is it green? 